y'all. Welcome to Miss Clark's chemistry class. I have been talking about solutions. All the properties of a solution, what makes up a solution, how to make your solution faster by making your dissolving faster. If you don't know what I'm talking about, that's because you've missed those videos. Back up a few videos and go check that out. And if you're still missing videos, it is because you have not hit that subscribe button. This lesson, we're gonna talk about solubility. Solubility is just the ability for things to dissolve, but it's way more in depth than that. So go grab your notes, get something to write with, and let's get started. Okay, so let's talk about solubility and everything that that means. Okay, so first let's look at the definition of solubility. That is the amount of solute that will dissolve in a solvent at a given temperature. Okay, let's pay attention to that. Amount of solute that will dissolve in a solvent at a given temperature. Temperature is important here. Basically, this definition is talking about how good something will dissolve. Can I dissolve a lot of this in water? Will not very much dissolve? And it doesn't necessarily have to be water. Water is the universal solvent, so a lot of the times we are talking about water. But the solvent doesn't necessarily have to be water. When I think of that word solubility, it's kind of like the ability to dissolve. If something is got a very low solubility, not much of it's going to dissolve. It's not going to be very good at dissolve. Or if something has a high solubility, that means we can add a lot of that solute into our solution and still get all of it to dissolve. Let's talk about two different types of solutes. If we have a solid solute and we're wanting to get more solid solute to dissolve, there are some things that we can do to make that happen. So let's think about I don't know, sugar and water. If we want more sugar to dissolve in our water, we would need to increase the temperature. If we increase the temperature, we can get more sugar to dissolve. At this point, I normally ask my students, where is the best sweet tea? And you know, I've been asking this question for just about as long as I've been teaching chemistry. And at this point, it's been about 18 years. And you know what? The answer has never changed. They always tell me either Chicken Express or Chick-fil-A. But you know why Chicken Express and Chick-fil-A have such good sweet tea? I'm assuming they have the best because y'all been telling me this for 18 years. I don't like tea. I know. I'm a Texas girl. We're supposed to love sweet tea. I actually hate sweet tea. But anyway, back to our sweet tea. Chick-fil-A and Chicken Express, the reason why they have such good sweet tea, they add all of their sugar to the tea while the tea is still hot. Have you ever noticed if you're at a restaurant and they bring you some tea and then you put sugar packets in it? We've already got ice in your tea. You're not going to get very much sugar to dissolve. You're gonna pour your sugar in, you're gonna stir, stir, stir. And then you know what? A lot of that sugar just falls right down to the bottom because cold solutions don't hold as much solute as hot solutions. So if we want more solid solute to dissolve, we need to heat up our solution. But what if we're talking about a gaseous solute? There's actually two ways to make more gaseous solute dissolve into solution. The first way is to decrease temperature. That's right, we're gonna make it colder. I always think about soda here. What happens when you leave a soda in the car, you've never opened it. You leave it in the car on a very, very hot day. You leave it there all day. And then you remember, oh, I left my Coke in the car. Let me go get it. I would really like it right now. So I run out to the car and I get it and I open it and it's like Psh! that big sound of the gas escaping when you open the bottle. I'm gonna come back to that sound in just a second. Do we enjoy, well, you know, I realize there's a few people out here that enjoy warm soda. But you know what? When you open that soda and that big sound happens, all that gas is escaping and it makes our soda taste flat. If we kept our soda cold, then more of that gas is going to stay in solution. Let's talk about why that is right quick. Let's jump back to the previous unit. We started talking about kinetic molecular theory. All particles are in constant random motion. And remember, the warmer the particles are, the more in motion they're going to be. So if our solution is hot, those particles are moving, 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 which is disrupting that gas particles that are in solution 
And when gas particles gain energy, they tend to leave solution. So the hotter the solution is, the gas particles want to leave that solution because the kinetic energy of those particles are so fast and they're moving around so much. But if we decrease the temperature of that solution, those particles start to move around less and less and less and it allows those gas particles to stay in solution. So if we want more gaseous solute to stay in solution, we need to decrease the temperature. The other way we can make more gaseous solute stay in solution is to increase the pressure. That brings me back to that ch sound when we open our Coke. Pressure is being released. Think about two Coke bottles, one brand new, never has been open, and one half of the soda's gone. Someone has drank it before. It might be you, it might be me, it might be somebody else. We've got these two sodas. Which one is going to taste fresher? That's right, the one that's never been opened before because its pressure has not been released. That pressure is pressing down on the gas particles, keeping it in solution. Because remember those gas particles, they have a lot of kinetic energy and they wanna just bang around. And when they start banging around, they leave solution. So if we have a high pressure, that pressure is going to press those gas particles into the solution. Let me see if I can draw a picture and, and explain what I'm talking about. I'm not the best artist. Y'all already know that. Here's our full bottle and here is our half drinking bottle. Okay, I realize my drawings are pretty terrible, but that's okay. Let's say there's even a lid on it. If we're talking about this bottle here, it's full, it's never been open. There are gas particles. That's that carbonation. That's why soda is so delicious. So I've got all these gas particles, but you know what? These gas particles have also escaped and they're filling this empty space here. When we open our Coke and it, tsh, that's what we're hearing. These gas particles are escaping. Look at all this empty space up here. Since there's more empty space because we have already drank some of this, the gas particles that are in our solution have also escaped into that empty space because remember, gas is going to fill the container. When you open this, now you've lost more of the carbonation. And when you lose more of the carbonation, we normally describe this when we're drinking soda, that this soda tastes flat. I realize there's a big group of you that like flat soda. I happen to not be one of them. But the reason why a half of the soda is going to get flatter faster, or even better yet, you know, the best time to drink a soda is right when you first open it. That's when it tastes the best, unless of course you like flat soda. But if you don't like flat soda, that's the best time. That's because you're only, you, you're only losing just a little bit of this carbonation. And then as you drink more and more and more of the soda, each time you come back to it, it tastes flatter and flatter and flatter. And this is why it's losing the carbonation because the pressure has decreased. In this first example here, the full, there's more pressure, less pressure. Less pressure causes these gas particles to come out. So two ways to have the most gaseous solute in solution. Decrease the temperature, slow those particles down, increase the pressure, keep those particles pressed down into solution. And here's a graph to show that. This is for the gases. If we start right up here with solubility and look at this temperature, this temperature is getting hotter, 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 hotter. So as the temperature gets hotter, these numbers here represent the relative solubility. So as the temperature increases, as we travel across one of these curves, we see that the amount is getting lower and lower. As the temperature increases, the solubility decreases. And of course, that is only for gases. It's the opposite, the opposite for solids. This graph would be just completely flipped because for solids, as the temperature increases, the solubility is also going to increase. So gases and solids, they act opposite here as well. Their properties are opposite and the way they behave in a solution also opposite. That shouldn't be very surprising. Here are some words we use to describe solutions. Concentrated and dilute. A concentrated solution has more solute dissolved. So if we like to drink a soda that has as much carbonation as possible, we want a concentrated solution. Concentrated with carbonation, that is. Or if you think about drinking Kool-Aid. Some people like their Kool-Aid to be very concentrated, very sweet. Lots of powder, lots of sugar dissolved in water, 
more, more, more. It's concentrated. The opposite of concentrated is dilute. This is when we have less amount of solute dissolved in solution. So to go back to our soda, a flat soda, that would mean the carbonation is dilute into the solution. There's less solute. Or for example, if we were going back to that Kool-Aid, maybe you don't like Kool-Aid that's very concentrated. Maybe you like a dilute Kool-Aid where you have just a little bit more water and a little bit less of the powder and the sugar. Let me just show you an example of what concentrated and dilute can look like. Before I go on to show you that example though, let me back up just a tiny sec. Concentrated and dilute, don't get those two vocab words confused with strong and weak. I only bring that up because I always remember my grandmother talking about the tea being weak. And so you might have heard of that as well. When she was talking about the tea being weak, that means there wasn't enough sugar in it. What she really meant was dilute. Strong and weak in chemistry, these words are saved for acids and bases specifically. Don't confuse concentrated and dilute with strong and weak. They do not mean the same thing in chemistry, even though in our normal day-to-day -day life, we often use those interchangeably. Okay, let's get to that example I was going to show you. So I know I drew my beakers in black, and so that's a little bit hard to see, but that's because that is not the important thing. If we had a concentrated, oh, let's talk about red Kool-Aid. If we had a concentrated container of red Kool-Aid, let's see what that might would look like. Pretty bright. And then as we travel all the way down to dilute Kool-Aid, let's see what the difference might look like. Oh, look, as we travel down, see how it's a little bit lighter? And then as we get all the way to dilute, even lighter. Concentrated, it's going to be the most bold, vibrant color if the solution has color. Because remember, more solute. This has less solute, so it's not quite as bright. And then this has the least solute, and so we would call this dilute. Now when we're talking about solutions, there's three other words we need to talk about as well. Concentrated and dilute, but even more specifically, we've got unsaturated, saturated, super saturated. I like to start talking about saturated first. I realize it's in the middle and not the first, but that's just kind of how I like to define these three words. When we talk about a solution being a saturated solution, that means the solution is holding the maximum amount of solute at that temperature. So a saturated solution is holding the maximum amount of solute. We put some sugar, we start to stir, we put some more sugar, we start to stir, we put some more sugar, start to stir. Oh, a little bit starting to fall to the bottom. That solution won't hold any more solution, so we're done. That's the amount of sugar that it'll hold the maximum amount. That's a saturated solution, the maximum. So unsaturated, I bet you can see where I'm going with that. This solution is holding on to less than the max. This solution is holding less than the maximum amount of solute, again, at a given temperature. And then we have super saturated, holding more than the maximum amount of solute at a given temperature. Maximum, that means as much as it can hold. So how can we hold more than the max? I didn't really look, make that look like more, did I? Let me rewrite that, more. More than the maximum amount. How are we gonna do that? If I'm holding as much stuff as I can hold, how can I hold even more than that? Okay, so that's why I said at this temperature, to create a super saturated solution, you have to do so very carefully. You've gotta put more than the max of solute in, and then you've gotta heat it up. We're gonna heat, 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 stir, 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 heat, heat. All of the solute will dissolve because remember, if we wanna increase solubility of a solid, all we have to do is increase the temperature. We just did that, all of it dissolved. Now, it's not super saturated because we've changed the temperature. It's actually saturated. Or it might even be unsaturated, I don't know. To get the super saturated solution, you then have to remove the substance from the heat source, let it cool back to that original temperature. If you do so slowly and gently, all of that solute will be forced into solution. That's that Chicken Express and Chick-fil-A tea. Put all that solute in while it's hot, let it gently cool down, holds all that sugar in the tea, that's how you get super sweet, sweet tea. The problem is, as a super saturated solution, it is very unstable because it's holding more than the max. Let me show you an example of that. If you were to disturb it by shaking it, stirring it, adding a little bit more solute, all of that solute fall right out of solution. That was pretty cool, huh? Now, when we talk about solubility, 
I've just been kind of using relative amounts, like a lot and a little, but this is a mathematic relationship. You can figure out how many grams of solute you can put in water to dissolve at a certain degrees. And we can chart this on a solubility curve. And before I show you some very specific examples, let me show you a generic example. If we have our chart, here's our, our axis, our X and Y axis. On our X axis, this is gonna be temperature. And on our Y axis, this is going to be the amount of solute. And let's just draw a curve. When you're looking at a solubility curve, this line here, this represents saturation, or better yet, a saturated solution. So if the temperature is here, then it's going to hold whatever number here, that much solute. Or if we increase the temperature here, if we march up, boom, 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 and we march across, this is how, whatever number this is, that is how much solute we should be able to dissolve in the solution to get this saturated solution. Well, let's say I give you a data point and that data point is down here somewhere. Well, if I ask you to describe that kind of solution, if it is underneath the curve, that's right, underneath, that is unsaturated. Or if I give you a data point and it's way off up here, above saturation, that's super saturated. But again, remember, it's only super saturated if all the solute stays in the solution. If it all falls to the bottom, not super saturated. Let me show you an example of a solubility curve that has lots of chemicals on it. I know that's kind of a lot, right? Let me point out a couple of things. Most of these are solids, and I can tell that this is a solid, 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 this is a solid. You get the idea, lots of solids. Now, you might be thinking, how did you know that? Well, I knew that because as the temperature increases, curves are increasing, the slope all increasing. To increase a solid solute, you need to increase the temperature. So as the temperature increases, if the solubility increases, that's a solid. Well, are you noticing, look, negative slope, negative slope. We can guess that those are gases because as the temperature increases, the solubility is decreasing. Now, a lot of times when you're looking at a solubility curve, your teacher is gonna ask you questions like, at 80 degrees, how much, here, let me write this down. At 80 degrees Celsius, how much NaNO3 would it take to get a saturated solution? Well, I'm gonna go 80 degrees, 80 degrees. Here is NaNO3. It crosses 80 degrees right there. So I'm gonna say that is about 145 grams. Well, grams of solute per 100 grams of water. So for every 100 grams of water, I should be able to dissolve 145 grams of sodium nitrate. That is very soluble. But let's say I give you a data point that is, um, let's say right here, and I'm asking about potassium nitrate. And I'm saying at 40 degrees Celsius, when you dissolve 90 grams of potassium nitrate, what kind of solution are you gonna get? Well, here's our, here's our solubility line for potassium nitrate, that's saturated. This dot is above the line. So if we're trying to dissolve 90 grams of potassium nitrate at 40 degrees, that is going to show us super saturated. Or I could even ask something like, if we start here at 50 degrees Celsius and we could dissolve 20 grams of KClO3, but let's say, so here, let me write that down. We've got 50 degrees and we are talking about KClO3. But let's say that I increase the temperature to 70 degrees. That would mean our data point would be here, right? If we increase the temperature, we've increased the temperature. There's our new data point. So at 50 degrees, when we had 20 grams of potassium chlorate, we had a saturated solution. But if we increase the temperature and do not increase solute, what kind of solution do we have now? Well, that data point is under the line, so that would be unsaturated. There's lots of different kinds of questions that could be asked about this curve, but hopefully that general information will get you everything that you need.
Okay, so we talked about solubility. We also talked about a couple of more properties that solubility has to do with solutions. I hope that helps. Again, there are still several more videos left in the solution series, so don't miss a single one. Until next time, bye y'all.